Hi, I'm Mauro Porcini, PepsiCo's Chief Design Officer. Join me for our new series where we dive into the minds of the greatest innovators of our time, with the goal of finding what drives them in their professional journey and in their personal life. Trying to uncover the universal truths that unite anyone attempting to have a meaningful impact in the world. This is In Your Shoes. True talent is when you are different and original, and the concept is really yours. True talent is not one-dimensional. It has a holistic vision and sees possibilities between existing models and new technologies. I'm quoting the guest of today. Together with her partner, Damian Chiam, she's the founder of Janu, a global creative and marketing executive search firm that provides highly personalized executive search and strategy within the luxury, beauty, and lifestyle industries. Over more than 30 years career, she's founded search offices in Amsterdam, in Geneva, Paris, Milan, New York, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. She co-founded Nonstock, the first non-traditional photography representation later acquired by Getty. In the 90s, she launched the award-winning online magazine for the arts, Identa, which featured the work of celebrity designers, architects, and artists. Her agency has reached, received numerous design awards for first in industry ad campaigns. Some of the award-winning campaigns are part of the permanent collection of the Cooper Hewitt. Janu Pachter, welcome to In Your Shoes. Thank you very much. Very happy to be here with you, Mara. Such a, such a pleasure. We've been knowing each other for, for many years, working in a variety of searches together. And over the years, I, I really learned to appreciate your in-depth understanding on the industry. I, you know, you're one of the best recruiter in the market uh, worldwide, probably because you're not just a recruiter. You are so much more than that, right? You, are, you live and breathe design. is your passion. is who you are. Can you tell us more about your journey? How did you arrive to where you are today? Where did you start from? Where, what happened in your life and how did you arrive to, to Well, first, thank you, you for your really kind words. Um, you know, I am Dutch and... Uh, the Dutch are, it's a design driven country because uh, half of the country is under sea level. And I don't, some people, not everybody knows that, but what that means is that throughout the history, Holland has always been fighting the water uh, for, for centuries. And so we learned how to build the dikes and how to, uh, you know, the, the, this, this strong kind of uh, design culture started, came from there, really. Um, and so I was surrounded, because I was born here in Amsterdam, um, I, I was surrounded by design. Everything around me was kind of breathing design. It was the, the minimalist, the modernist time. Uh, it's... It, it, you know, it's, it's, it's Dutch, Dutch design. And it's kind of interesting because it's so very different from you, where you come from. You know, the, the Dutch are very sort of a little standoffish. They are very, you know, minimal in their expressions as well as in their design. And, uh, and yet they also are very experiential. Like if you look at the work of uh, the, for example, in the in 1984, uh, the money, you know, uh, the money was the, 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 at the time it was a gilder, so there was no euro. But the PTT, which is the the Dutch government-led postal organization, uh, believed like all the other, you know, uh, government-run organizations, very much in good design and how important design was for communication, for clarity, all of that. And so I was I was constantly surrounded by the beauty of design and the simplicity of it. If you I don't know if you ever seen the Dutch money, but it won awards. And that's kind of amazing to to think that from a government design driven place. I mean if you look at like uh, our postal system right in New York, um, it is kind of different, right? <laughs> Night and day. 
Um, but so, yeah, I grew up with that. Mondrian, Rietveld, you know, it was sort of all in my, in my being. Um, and it made a big dent on, I think, how I look at design and how I talk to designers and what it was like coming to New York. Um, I took How that. did you start then? How, what was your first job? My first job? Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. I was a receptionist um, uh, and I worked for Siegel and Gale, which later became a client. And um, Siegel and Gale is, became very large. But when I was a receptionist, it was Alan Siegel, his wife, Gloria, and, um, and then maybe 20 people or maybe not even. And I answered the phone and I was just new in the country and didn't really, I mean, I, I, I could speak okay and I could read English, but uh, I wasn't that familiar with the colloquium, with the, with, you know, the ways people speak. And so I remember there was this, this client that came to meet with Ellen and he announced himself, and I call Alan, uh, and I said, here's Mr. So-and-so to see you. And Alan said, oh, well, send him back. And I said to the client, I'm sorry, but uh, Mr. Siegel cannot see you now. Uh, and he said, but I have an appointment. So I called Alan again, and I said, are you sure that uh, you want to send Mr. So-and-so back? He said, send him back. So... <laughs> I, I, so the guy left and I told him Mr. Siegel cannot see you and uh, he never fired me you know I was like amazed like nor normally you would have lost your job instantly but he thought it was interesting and, and, and it's also fun funny because Siegel and Gale was about simplifying language so I took that very literally you know like sent him back that's simplifying. Like he should have said, uh, sent him to my office in the back. <laughs> <Something> <laughs> anyway, that was my first job. I got paid, I think, two hundred dollars a month. But I loved it because Siegel and Gale had, you know, this this design environment which reminded me of Holland, and I felt I felt very at home in that place. And then, how do you become a, a recruiter? and such a successful recruiter? Um, I don't know, the journey, you know, I, I, I was okay. So I got married way too young, I got kids way too young, and I got divorced too young. So all of that happened at the same time. And I had to make more money uh, because I couldn't survive on $200 a month. And I was looking in the paper and I was looking like, what can I do? And I worked for several di different companies. I worked for Harker Grace Jovanovich as an, an assistant editor, as a part-time thing, but it was not full-time. And then I got lucky because I found an, a position for a, um, an, an, a recruiter. I didn't even know what that meant, recruiter, what is that? Anyway, it sounded interesting because it had the word creative in it. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to go and give it a shot. And so this guy interviewed me and uh, uh, showed me a portfolio of a designer. And he said, tell me what you think about the work. And I had not seen a port, a graphic, I mean, you know, I was not really trained as a designer. I come from an entirely different background. And so I just had to go for my gut. And I was, I thought it's, it's this, you know, sink or, or swim. And I, told him exactly my thoughts about each page and lucky i was just lucky the guy agreed with me and i got the job uh and that was the beginning of recruiting and i did that for a few years and i learned um so much i learned about pricing evaluating you know work uh it was mostly based on freelance because this was not full time yet that was my next step uh, but that's kind of how i, I got into it you know, I really, is, I'm not saying this because you are in front of me, but I really believe that your job is one of the most important in, uh, in, in our industry, but in general in the world of business. Uh, many companies, especially the big ones, usually talk about processes and tools and they try to solve everything through that. And the reality is that the most important variable in all of this is people. You can give people... You know, imagine you give pro processes and tools are like a brush. They're actually tools, but 
uh, you can give this tool or this brush to Picasso, you can give it to a kid and the results will be very, very different. So people are really, really important. How do you select the right people? How do you find the right people? But that, how, mostly, how do you understand that the person that you have in front of you is the right one, especially when you don't know them in depth, when you talk with them you know, for a few hours here and there? What's your strategy? It's not a strategy. It's, it's kind of working from my intuition. As, as soon as somebody walks in, I mean, everybody has that, right? You, you, make an, you have an impression of a person. But then once that person comes in and sits down and starts to talk, to talk about him or herself, show the work, you get a really good sense of a person. And especially when you don't ask the, 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 the questions like, um, well, uh, you know, like the, the human resource type of questions. I am much more interested in understanding how somebody comes up with an idea, what motivated, what inspired her. I keep saying him. I'm going to say her from now on. Um, and that gives me the feel, the sense of, oh, you're about that. I, I, I know you. And nobody is the same. Everybody has like different, you know, works and and but then then it starts to form in me like ah, this person would be amazing for such and such company and my my joy is to make introductions uh, to clients where I do not have a search but where upon meeting and interviewing a particular candidate and I feel oh this is the guy I'm sorry this is the woman then to call my client and say, you need to meet her. Um, she, you, I know you love her. So that's, I've made actually a lot of placements having done that way, but you cannot always do that because uh, most of the Fortune 500 companies have very strict rules. You can only work on a search if you have been given the search and there is a contract signed for that search. Uh, for me, it's much better to have a, a relationship with a client where the, the you know where the contact the part there is a partnership like I know you Mauro I know, I know what you're looking for and so even if I'm not working on anything on anything and I've done that with you before in the past uh, if I see somebody that I think you're gonna love this person I'd, I'd like to you know either send a text or, or pick up the phone and say hey you should meet her. She's amazing. Yeah. And this is why. And you, you've been quoted uh, talking about uh, the ideal designer, the ideal profile for innovation positions uh, or branding like a Renaissance man or woman. Uh, what is a Renaissance woman for you? Um, that is somebody who has both left and right brain. And not just that but somebody who is truly evolved and doesn't come with just design speak, but somebody who loves the theater, who loves culture and global, you know, who is, has an interest in every thing that is interesting in the world, not just in the U S or not just in Europe, where you get a sense of this person can pull out of their, um, their history of, of knowledge, uh, creativity. And I think that's a true Renaissance person where you, and of course you use the library, you use research, you use your own educational background, but the, the openness of mind, you know, the interest in other cultures to me is what makes a person a really interesting Renaissance type of person. And I think we're coming back to that more and more. It was something I saw happening more in, in, in Holland back in the 80s and the 90s. And then I came to the US and it became all very narrow, you know. But, but now more and more people are just more of organic Renaissance thinkers who, who pull it all together and have a wealth of, of information and knowledge. And, and that is great. That I love that. I agree so much with you. I, I, we live in a moment where everything is accelerated and there is there are many 
competitors out there more than in the past in many industries because m- many of the barriers to entry, especially of these big corporations, are down because of the global market, social media. Uh, we, we live in the world of the startups, of new brands, new ideas. Uh, it's m- so much more democratic, the process of innovation. And therefore, either you have leaders, in not just in design or in innovation, but in business in general, there are holistic leaders that are, that are leaders at 360 degrees, or it would be very difficult to compete at this space, you know, this model where you have hyper-specialized people that you connect through processes is not that efficient, it's not fast enough, it's not reactive enough. So I thought I thought I agree with you on this. Yeah. Something else that I learned to value in the past 10 years, it was always part of who I am, but I always gave it for granted. And then step by step, I realized there was something kind of unique is what I call kindness, is something, you know, being nice to each other. So if I look at the team that we have today in PepsiCo, for instance, is a team of nice people or good people that are there for the big dream, for the cause, and they're there to help each other. And again, I realized that it's not that obvious. And that's why in the past few years, I've been very, very vocal about the need of, you know, being a good person. Be kind is for me criteria number zero when I search somebody. The first criteria, how important it is for you, this idea of kindness and being a good person? And do you think it's common in corporation? Is not, you know, is valuable? Is not? What do you think about it? I have always put kindness as number one when I was like a kid. That to me, I didn't realize it until I got you know, banged up and beaten up. <laughs> I mean, don't, I don't mean physically, but by people, by their words. And I thought, why couldn't that person say that in a different way? Why, why this meanness or this uh, unpleasantness, you know? And I think that kindness is so underrated. And to me, it is empathy, kindness. It's all that. And that is something that you cannot really learn. It's not part of the, you know, it's like part of the multi-senses that that if you are a really full-grown person, you that kindness uh, is is as important as intelligence. Uh, it's it's for whom that who you are, what makes you, and so much more can be accomplished with your peers with everybody who you are in touch with by having a kind heart and it's true that that's lacking you know a lot and and i'm so glad that you are talking about this and that you find this important because a lot of our clients on the corporate end don't have that uh they, they don't they don't even consider it to be part of an uh, of a total human being, of, of you know, they're looking more at the skill sets and education uh, and management and all of this. And the kindness is never it, 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 nobody talks about that. But I think it is crucial. Yeah. yeah. Well, the way I try to push it for people that don't value kindness as such, I think you should just value kindness for what it is. But even if you don't, what I usually tell them is, look, if you have nice people in a team they are going to trust each other and they're going to enjoy working with each other. So the level of engagement of your team is going to raise, but mostly the productivity is going to raise because you have people working together in a more productive way. You won't have people doing things behind the back of others because they're afraid, they don't trust each other. So it's a productive move. It strategically makes sense, even if you don't care about kindness. Right. But I think that kindness and fear, I mean, fear in a company, a lot of people are are not motivated by fear, but by run by fear of doing something uh, that that might shock or shake something up. And if, if it's met with kindness, then so much more can be accomplished, right? Uh, I totally, totally agree. You, you mentioned fear. There is another kind of fear unrelated to, to what we're discussing about uh, discussing now. That is the fear of failing, the, f- the fear of making mistakes, 
that is inside our, you know, human being, you know, in, in, in each of us, and therefore also in the culture of these companies. But we know very well that failure is so important when you drive innovation. You know, it, it's part of innovation. You need to experiment, and, and therefore, uh, you, if you experiment, sooner or later you will fail to finally arrive to the right solution. It's funny because in the science world, uh, the scientists call those failures experiments is more the business world that call those experiments failures but again they're part of the innovation process of a company but also of us as human beings so how, what do you think about failure and how did you manage eventual failures in your in your life uh, how, how did you how do you relate with the idea of failure <laughs> well okay i've had several failures in my life uh, at, at all levels, professionally and personally. And, um, and you know, the thing is, yeah, it's so easy to say you learn from your failures and you get up and, you know, you get yourself by your bootstraps. It's easy to say. It's not always easy to do. And uh, I think not everybody can do it. Uh, not everybody has the strength or the uh, prep. Um, perseverance to do it so in my life um I've, I've well yeah i've gone through a lot of stuff i you know i, I started my uh, first company in 1984 with my partner uh and not 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 damien that was another partner and for 30 years we ran a successful company where indeed we had these offices in paris and milan and amsterdam and la and after 30 year, years we got you know the economic downfall and things all it started to fall apart it just didn't work anymore the model the people it was just a, a total mess um and i kind of had had to sell the company after 30 years of success that was a difficult thing to do um and i lost some of my best recruiters who were my best not my best friends but they were close friends and allies and they left me uh, in, in, I think, in a shabby way. And so that, that was a, a difficult thing for me to overcome. Anyway, that was hard to do, but I thought I saw a light <laughs> and, uh, and a new company, you know, a company that followed me uh, came to me and said, hey, you know, um, you're the best in creative search. We'd like to acquire you. So I thought that this was the saving grace. Well, I made a big mistake. It was the wrong partner. And so um, it didn't work out. But at that, when that didn't work out, it was two things of failure after, you know, that came very short time after each other. And I was truly at a very low point in my life uh, and didn't know what to do because I had actually lost pretty much everything a person can lose. And uh, I got it together, but not by myself. Um, I had a, a really close friend who helped me through this, but then I met Damien. And Damien, who is my present business partner, believed in the power of the brand Janu. And that's why we called it Janu, because I was... You know, people don't always Janu Pacter. It's always about Janu. And he said, you know what? We can rebuild you. You you have to make a comeback because people know you. They have worked with you. I mean, don't don't give up. And this is um, for me the turning point in my life that somebody who was a super smart business person actually believed in me and, and could see that there was a potential to come back. Uh, if you, as you know, Mauro, when you're leaving the business for a few years, it, you have to come, it, coming back is really hard. It's because they, you, the competitors are all there to take over, especially people that used to work for you who quickly built on your past history. So, uh, but I did it and we did it very small. We started, you know, t t the two of us and uh, it was incredible because he didn't give up, I didn't give up, and he sort of, we complement each other in, in many different ways, which is excellent. I did not want another me at all, and so we're two opposites. 
But I think, so Damien is a huge part of why I'm here. And the other part is uh, both my parents were Holocaust survivors. My, my father was in the camps from 40, 45. Uh, he was a doctor and therefore he survived in the camps. And my mother joined the resistance. Uh, she did underground work. She helped Jews find uh, hiding places, made false passports. And she was caught and was in the, in the camps as well. And they both came out damaged but alive. But what I learned from these people was you never, ever give up. I, I'm a survivor and I will continue fighting. I mean, I don't have to fight anymore because I have achieved what I wanted to achieve. And that is total happiness, having fun in what I'm doing, having a, a, a commercial success uh, together with my partner. And so I've, I went through all of these obstacles, but it has been really tough. You know, it's not been an easy road. And I'm sure that a lot of people who go up have had diff similar, not the same, but other difficulties. And if you if you're able to to fight them, to 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 work it out, then then life is even better than before. Well, so many beautiful lessons in such a short story. You know, the inspiration of your parents, the power of partnership with somebody that is complementary to you. And often people are afraid of people that are different than ourselves. Even the willingness of Damien to bet on your brand and the power of personal branding, both for yourself as a human being and, of course, for your business. Uh, and often for people like us, business and, and your personal life are very closely merged together. And so it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful story, the power of resilience and resistance. But also, you didn't mention it, but it's part of the story, your dreams. And, you know, you wanted to, to get somewhere and, 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 and you did it and you kept doing it and you, and you need to keep fighting uh, yeah. to be there. And then finally, you use one of my favorite keywords, happiness, because at the end of the day, it's all about that, right? It's all about being happy. If you're not happy in doing what you're doing, you should just change. And, yeah. and I also believe even broader than that, that companies should give happiness to their employees. They should give happiness to the society. That should be really the most important value of any kind of organization. So it's a beautiful story, the one, the one you share. Uh, talking about personal branding, uh, you, you build over the years a strong, strong personal brand. Um, how important it is personal branding for the people you recruit, for any of us? Uh, uh, is it important to build a personal brand? And if it is, how do you build a personal brand in this new world that is totally social media driven? Uh, and therefore, there are so many opportunities to, to actually do that. Are you referring to uh, people that are uh, working full time or are you talk referring to people that are independent designers who have a consultancy? Uh, to both, but probably I'm thinking of probably more about the people that work in a company. Let's say you are the design manager of a big company and and. In the meantime, you can build your brand and your brand can create value also for your company because it will help you attracting more talents to the company. At the end of the day, we know very well that people follow people. You go you know, to, to work for a leader the most of the time, not just for the brand. It's a combination of both. Uh, so the more people uh, that you have that are real leader and the people know about their leadership skills, the more value you have also as a company. So how can these people build their personal brand, be more out there? Uh, I met so many unbelievable talents, amazing talents, and nobody knows who they are. And so when, when you try to recruit for certain companies, uh, people that need to work under these leaders, these people are like, well, who is this person? Who is this woman, this man? So the importance of building your brand when you work in a company uh, is, is for me, is key. Uh, what do you think about this? Is, is it important? Is not? How do you build your brand when you work in a company? Yeah, I, I think build your brand could be know who you are and 
be your true self and be true, yeah, authentic. And uh, once you, because if you have achieved, if you feel that way and you know who you are, and, and a lot of people don't, I can, I can tell when I interview them, even some people at the executive levels, they ask me questions that I wonder like, wow, don't you, I'm, I'm surprised, but I think that that's, that is part of who you are is your brand. That is how you come across. That is the, how you, the, the world will see you, you know, and that has to do with confidence and all of that awareness, consciousness. And I think this is to me very interesting because now, nowadays and in the future, more than ever, this brand, as you call it, is, is crucially important because uh, companies are struggling. You know, the, the, the current model, the current business model is not working anymore. It's like a mess. It's, it needs to be rethought. There has to be a complete transformation in everything because of what's happening in the world. It's a reflection of that. And so we need CEOs need to kind of work with creative talent. And I'm not saying that creative talent has like the answers, but they certainly can give ideas and direction and understand about the future of the world and the product and how people are going to live and what they are going to, how they're going to change. And that's, again, if you're, if you know who you are, if you have, if you're a strong brand, then you are in a position to actually help the, the, the senior executive, you know, level in companies and brands to help them make this transformation, go and, and, tr and, and go through a whole innovation, uh, thing and uh, people who are still looking for jobs and uh, are just kind of th th those people it's, I mean they're, they're necessary and we, we, we will place them but for me the most interesting in people are those that want to help change the current climate you know I call it climate but it's the, the world and they are now more needed than ever and uh, I think it is an incredible opportunity for really super top creative talent to do that. And I think that's, that executive leadership should really listen to that type of talent because it's, it's the future. It's a designer of the future. They are not people that solve problems. They, these are designers that know what will happen in the next five years or 10 years or not know, but they have an instinct and intuition to climate change, you know, black lives matter and the, the, everything that's happening. They're totally in tune with that current landscape and they not people that come that are technical or that are strictly marketing. It's the creative in talent that has the ideas that should be now they're they're incredibly necessary. I'm 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 taking your question way too far, but nice um, totally. I is exactly what I was expecting, and I totally agree <laughs> with with what you are what you are saying. You, you mentioned Black Lives Matter in the in the past few years, not just in the past few months, but in the past few years, there have been many changes and a new awareness about the importance of diversity at many levels. Uh, a big focus on gender diversity. Uh, that started a few years ago, and now a new focus on uh, on um, on a variety of different kinds of diversity. Black Lives Matter is a manifestation of this. How important important it is diversity for you, and how difficult it is to find diverse people. Especially, I'm thinking about gender, and now more recently, African American or or, or black people uh, in the design community. Uh, is it, is it a challenge and um, in, in okay. case why? Many questions in one. <laughs> You're, I can talk for an hour about this one. Um, this particular question is for me uh, incredibly important. And I've been thinking about this for a really long time and wondering like, well, how can we change this? So 
Diversity is what makes a company a better company. Uh, it's, it's essential that a company hires all kinds of different people from different cultures. Uh, from, they have to have an open mind. And as of now, it's not happening and it hasn't happened. And it's interesting because, you know, I've been in the business for a long, long time. And I remember 15 years ago, the exact same question. Janu, we want the get us a, diver, a candidate that's diverse, right? I, I mean, even 20 years ago. And every time we get this request, we are struggling. We are struggling because we do not find enough diverse talent. And so the burden comes on the corporate HR departments and on us, the search firms. So we are given the task of finding people that either are very few out there uh, or that are not uh, qualified for the particular searches that we're working on because those people didn't have the same opportunities and chances that the white male had. And so I think instead of hiring the wrong talent for a role, if, if the perfect person with the right qualifications walks in and happens to be a white male, then that person needs to be hired for that role. What we need to do and this comes from the corporates, you know, from, from, from the, the, the executive leadership in companies, they need to realize that in order to attract diverse talent, they have to start. The, 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 the burden is on them to make a change. And that means uh, not coming with some few little programs here or there. No, to put a substantial budget for Hire for 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 empowering diverse talent, for making an environment where diverse talent feels comfortable, supported, respected, with a future to stay in that company for for jobs, and that means you hire people that are not qualified or don't have the skills, and but they have the potential, they have the desire, they have the, the will, they they are interested. Um, and then that con the, the fortune, the, the big global companies should have the funding in place for further education, for executive leadership programs, for management training, for all of the things that we're looking for in diverse talent. That's not always there. And, and so they have a place in your company, but they need to be to be groomed and built and educated further. Uh, they, they, and that's simply because they didn't have the opportunities. You know, there has been a systemic oppression in this country uh, of diverse talent. And we need corporations ex as well as the government must put a lot of money. A lot, I'm not talking about one or two million. I'm talking about millions and put that toward the advancement of talent that is badly needed for a company to be successful, truly diverse, and, and, and come and have innovation going on. I was talking with uh, a very, very talented um, African-American designer in one of the previous podcasts, and one of the advices that he, he was giving me was also to invest in education, you know, to really uh, help African American first of all get access to the design schools, but mostly also it was this was very interesting to build awareness that design can be a career, it can be a career where, yeah. you know, if you have that chance to study that many unfortunately don't have, you you can choose also this career, and this career can be really you know great for your happiness and your purpose in life and your realization but you can also make money with it because many many people he was telling me you know are like well you know if i have a chance i need to make sure that i leverage that chance for me and my family that is investing in me 
So building awareness is probably something very important as well. You know, this yeah. is a career very, yeah. Right. What do you think? And I think once uh, people have the awareness of, of design and other professions and they feel uh, it's safe to go to a, a company, you know, any Fortune 500 company where they're welcome, you'll see that HR and search firms will have no problem attracting them. They will come like flies because this is where you have a safe environment. This is where you can actually advance your career and that's where you want to be. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's so simple, you know, it's, it's really not an, an, a huge problem to solve. It's very simple. Create an environment and people will come to you. Okay. But that environment is not there now. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about, I'm generalizing with all for Fortune 500 companies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I will go on and on and on for hours to talk about these topics with you, Janu. Um, but I have w just one last question. That is a yeah. question I, I have to make and I think many people expect. As a recruiter, what is your advice to anybody uh, that goes to an interview and he or she has one hour in front of somebody to sell, you know, the idea of himself or herself and how good they are. What should they do? <laughs> That's an easy <laughs> answer. Uh, and I, I'd like to reverse that question too, because it's not just the candidate, but it is the interviewer as well. And that is what I want to say is that be authentic, be yourself. You know, because, okay, when you go out on a date for the first time, you want to be the most charming, you know, person so that you can have a second date and you will be everything perfect. Well, first of all, that never works anyway, because uh, soon enough, the real you comes out and who knows, will you still be loved? But in a job, it's really key that you... Uh, that you come across as exactly who you are and, and what you want to do, what your desires are. So there should not be, an, you know, and the questions from the interviewer should be not just about uh, tell me about your skills and how, how you know, it should be more, but who, who are you? What, what interests, what kind of interests do you have? What do you think of other companies? What, why are you here? What makes you excited being here? And then that person, the, the more honest you are, the better it is. But that also means that the interviewer has to say everything, you know, instead of, oh, we have an amazing group of people. Everybody loves here to be here. Nobody ever leaves. It would be much better for that person to say, look, we have some challenges. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you what they are. But we're working on them, and I think somebody like you could actually be a catalyst to solve some of these problems. So here you then have something where people are both honest with each other and they level. And then you know this is the place for me or it isn't. Both people will know instead of this fake, uh, the perfect this and the perfect that. It's, it's going to, after two, three months... Uh, you're going to be unhappy and your boss will be unhappy. So it's better to be honest on day one. Well, you, I said it was the, the last question, but I have another one. Because <laughs> you say something and made me think. Um, you, you were talking about authenticity, you know, and essentially being transparent, be who you are. And, and so many times when you look at the profile of people, for instance, in platforms like LinkedIn, you see one dimension the professional dimension, the perfect dimension. And the reality is people are also what they do in their weekends, their hobbies, their, you know, their private life, their friends. Uh, and, but, but usually you separate the dimensions, you know, your private life from your professional life. But then in reality, when you go to work, you take your private life with you, inside you is who you are. So would you recommend to people to mix a little bit more the private and the professional in the way they talk about themselves, not just in an interview, but also in their social media platforms? Or we should keep them anyway separate? There are platforms for work and platforms for, for fun or private life or personal things. What do you think, think in this new world we live in? Definitely, of mixing both. Uh, it, 
you you want to know what somebody is like, who he is, who she is, and um, that would make somebody much more of an interesting, whole, uh, rounded person rather than this is my edu- this is my professional career and this is who I am on the weekends. And I think the more interesting people have combined that and l- work and life and play. It's all one thing. Um, I see that also as the, the the designer of the future that that is able to do all of these, you know, the, the personal and the professional combined. And that should come out in your social media. It should be uh, discussed when you have an interview and when you approach a company in your in your letter writing or, or whatever you do to get, yeah, because that, that's who you really are, right? Absolutely. There's not two people. It's like many different people in one and we want to know all about you but all the things you do. I'm totally in agreement. Well, Janu, thank you so much. We talk about resilience and love and people and empathy and, and, and diversity. We touch so many topics and there will be so many more that we could touch, but we have a limited time. This was great. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you, Mauro. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was so much fun and I really enjoyed it. Thank you.